I worked at a mental hospital. So oh, I'm not Jesus crazy. Christ. God damn. That's rough. Stop. Please tell me I'm recording. Okay. Stop, Doc. It's a hospital. All these stories are gonna be clubbed. I was just a regular 29 year old girl living my life and trying to make a difference as a nurse. Working at the hospital was both exciting and challenging. One day, there was this patient named Edward Dawson who came with a broken leg. From the moment I met him, something about him felt really off. His intense gaze made my skin crawl. Usually we can get some pretty weird patients, but this one was completely different. The vibes were all off with him and it made me super uncomfortable. He stayed in the hospital for a few days because we needed to perform some extra surgery for his leg. But as time went on, it felt like he was becoming weirdly fixated on me. He would constantly ask me questions I was not okay with, and even being extremely inappropriate to me, which he got yelled at for by other nursing staff. About a month after his release, I never saw him again, and was happy, because it was by far the weirdest patient I've had in my years of working as a nurse. One day, as I was preparing medication at the nurse's station, I heard a whisper from the right side of me go, You have such beautiful eyes. What the hell? I can see so much in them. I froze and looked. And guess who it was? Edward. I was shocked. I looked at him and asked him how he had become a nurse so fast. I just finished nursing school, he said, and I just so happened to get placed here. Crazy, right? He laughed as if this was all one funny joke we shared. From that moment on, Edward seemed to be following me everywhere. He would show up unexpectedly in the corridors or outside the hospital, always watching me while I would do simple tasks. He somehow got hold of my number. And then he started sending me text messages filled with disturbingly intimate details about my personal life. I was terrified because I don't know how he would know all this information, but I assumed one of the coworkers was telling him everything about me, so I tried to brush it off. One evening, as I left the hospital, that's some clock shit to do. That's some real clock shit to do. To be friends slash coworkers. Right. But you know. I'm saying that she knows. That one of the other co-workers is on some stalker shit. Is on some clock shit. On some Nikes. And you gonna. You gonna tell them everything about me? What we, what we shared in secret? Cool. I got you. No, it's okay. It's fine, Becky. It's fine. A long shift, I noticed a dark figure standing across the street. My heart skipped a beat when I realized that it was Edward. He was just standing there, watching me, and he didn't move. I quickened my pace, tried not to make eye contact, and I got in my car. After this happened, the text messages from Edward... The whole time you're in the hospital, what is security at? Come on now. Became more frequent and way more disturbing. He would reference moments from my day, things he couldn't possibly know unless he had been following me. At this point, it really started to freak me out, and I didn't want to be alone at night. One night, I finally got a chance to let loose and have some fun with my friends. We went to a local hangout spot, laughing and enjoying each other's company. It was a much needed break from the stress of work. As the night went on, my phone buzzed with a notification. I looked at it, and my heart sank. It was a message from my home security system's ring camera, showing activity at my house. My friends noticed the change in my expression and asked me what was wrong. It's Edward, guys, I muttered, my voice trembling. My security camera caught him walking around my house in the middle of the night. My friends were now also super freaked out. Emily, this is serious, Lisa exclaimed. You have to call the cops now, and we should get somewhere that's not in public. We left immediately and went to Lisa's, how as that was the only one of us in the group that Edward had never talked to because she doesn't work at the hospital with us. We got back to her house and we sat down to watch him over the ring camera as we called the police. Edward was trying to break in. He tried everything, lifting the window to climbing on my roof to trying to break down the door. 
The police told me that they would prioritize my and my friend's safety first after they showed up at Lisa's house. As we waited for them to arrive, my friend stayed by my side, providing comfort and support. They arrested Edward almost immediately when they got to my house. Y'all should have, y'all should have, y'all man. That's a gang of y'all and only one of him. You know, y'all should have like surprised the hell out of him and just beat the living shit out of him on me. Weeks after this happened, they started an investigation and they came to find out he wasn't even a real doctor. He was impersonating one and worked there for weeks. I could barely sleep after knowing I had a stalker for months and had zero idea that all the information he gotten was from my medical records that he happened to secretly grab while at the hospital. Still to this day, I think about it from time to time, but I haven't heard a single thing about him or his name since. I hope so. Right. I'm going to tell you the bone chilling story of my I do not know why this picture is so creepy. Am I the only one that sees that? Or no? It looks so creepy. I don't know what it is. I can't really pinpoint why it's so creepy, but it is. With a super creepy patient in the hospital ward. I've always been drawn to the medical field because I've always done well caring for others. I'm a 23-year-old woman who works at my local hospital on night shifts. One night, I entered room 307, where it was a single bedroom, and there, lying in the bed, was Mr. Jacobson, an elderly patient in his late 80s who was a terminal patient and blind in both eyes. He was a wise person who was perfectly okay with nearing the end of his journey. I want to mention that we developed a friendly liking for each other. But I tried not to get too closely attached to patients who were not going to be here for much longer, as it really did a number on my mental health. As I approached his bedside, Mr. Jacobson turned his head towards me. His clouded eyes looked at me, his voice raspy as he spoke. Ah, the nurse has arrived. I've been expecting you, my dear. I smiled back and said, Good evening, Mr. Jacobson. How are you feeling today? He chuckled softly. And I was his said, Hold on! Mother Clucker? Let me pause you right there. Don't you ever in your life call me a dear. Okay? Because I got peripheral vision. Deers don't. Don't do that. Don't look like a deer to you, you mother. I should cluck you up. But we in the hospital. Surrounded by security, so I'm not going to do all that. And cameras. But let me catch your ass outside was always comforting as it reminded me that things will be okay in the long run of life. Feeling, oh my dear, I am but a mere vessel drifting between realms. Time doesn't hold much meaning for me now, he said. It was the strangest thing that I've ever heard him say since my time of nursing him. I knew of him to be poetic and deep, but this was extremely strange behavior for him. I tried the best I could to decipher what he meant, but nothing was making sense. Confused and super creeped out, I asked. What do you mean, Mr. Jacobson? Like a butterfly, you will too awaken in my own time very soon, my love. What? Those words hit me hard. They were exactly what my late grandmother used to say, a reminder that change and growth come at their own pace. How did Mr. Jacobson know this? I began to tear up from the intense emotions I was feeling. I was scared, yet confused. I couldn't hold back my curiosity any longer. My voice trembling, I asked, How... How did you know about that phrase? It's something that only my grandmother used to say. Mr. Jacobson's tired eyes met mine, and a look of sadness appeared on his face. Some connections go beyond life. We both cried together, holding on to that moment. I didn't want to understand everything that had happened, but it made me feel something deep inside. Mr. Jacobson's words about my grandmother were like a secret, something I couldn't explain but held on to dearly. As time passed, I kept those words close to my heart. They brought me comfort when I felt lost or unsure. Knowing that my grandmother's love extended beyond her passing gave me strength and hope. Now, standing here today, I carry the wisdom of those connected voices. I embrace the mystery and the things I can't fully understand. Mr. Jacobson's encounter showed me that there are connections that go beyond time and space, and they give us a sense of purpose and guidance. 
So I continue on my journey with newfound strength and an open mind. The mysteries of life unfold before me like a butterfly emerging from its cocoon. You got all that. You got all that. Hell no. I was walking. This happened back in the 1980s as I was a nurse. I worked at a mental hospital. So oh, I'm not Jesus crazy. Christ. God damn. <sighs> That's rough. And met a lot of people that were a bit out of it. But they were never anything we couldn't handle. But one day, there was this one patient, Jacob, who was straight up off his rocker. I'm talking about a guy who made Jack Nicholson's character in The Shining look like Mary Poppins. The dude had a twisted fascination with causing harm. It was really disturbing, and I did not enjoy going into his room when it was my job to help him. One night, I was doing the rounds, and at nighttime, our patients needed sleep, so we shut all the lights off except for a few so the entire hallway is blacked out. The only source of light was my work pen, which had a light button on it so I could flash down the hallway to see. I went down to Jacob's room to make sure he was in bed and sleeping, but as I approached Ward 13, the door was wide open. I entered my room with a small light from my pen. Everything was a mess inside. Furniture was overturned, sheets were torn, and there was what I thought to be blood stains on the walls. It seemed like a storm of madness had swept through. What made it even scarier was that Jacob was considered dangerous, so we had restrained him with strong restraints on his arms and legs. Yet somehow, he managed to break out from these, which was almost impossible. With a heavy feeling in the air, I caught- You know why? There were strengths on his arms and legs? You, you probably used some Reebok or strengths. Or some Nikes. You know? Or some off-brand type of restraints. When you should have been using Adidas. That's all I'm saying. I don't want to tell you what to do, but that's you should have just you should have because he would have never broke free. Just saying. Yeah, I used the weak ass Nike restraints. What the hell? We moved towards the door that led to the downstairs storage area, a place only allowed in to staff. But we searched every spot for him, and this was the last area left, so he had to be there. Suddenly, I saw a figure darting behind some shelves. I didn't know what was about to happen next, but I was ready to fight this lunatic if he attacked me. Carefully, I made my way through the narrow aisles, trying to find Jacob. It was pitch black and silent, and still, the only source of light was from my pen. Out in the corner, I saw Jacob crouched beside an old locker. He held a shiny scalpel in his hand, and he was smiling. Frozen with fear, I watched as he stood up, a sickening smile on his face. He started walking towards me, the scalpel in one hand. He swung the scalpel at me, narrowly missing. I dodged and fought back. In the middle of this fight, as Jacob swung the sharp tool, another nurse came running. She, with a syringe filled with strong medicine, injected it into Jacob's back, sedating him. Almost right away, the medicine started. This is a hospital fault. I, mean, I feel like anything that they're doing with the mental or if you crazy, there has to be hella security officers or police officers on deck 24 seven. Cause there's no reason this interaction should have happened. Working and Jacob collapsed and passed out. Security arrived soon after oh, yeah? and they helped us to completely restrain Jacob, uh, making sure that he wouldn't harm anyone else. After this scary incident, the hospital decided to move Jacob to a different mental health facility that could provide more intense care. They realized how serious his condition was and wanted him to get specialized treatment that he needed. Since then, I've never met a crazier patient than him. That's enough. With that, that's enough. You don't need no more crazy ass patients. This took place in the early 90s. I was a male x-ray tech at a large multi-campus hospital. I worked evenings and I loved it. I had some great coworkers, one being one of my best friends. One day, I got a page for a phone call. I picked up the phone and said, this is Luke. There was a slight pause. Then I heard a female voice saying that she really appreciated how kind I was the other night. It caught me off guard, but I said thank you and asked her who I was talking to. Another pause and she said all in due time 
and then hung up. I had no idea who it was and thought my friend was probably pranking me. I didn't say anything to anyone that night, figuring whoever was pulling my leg would trip up and say something. I went home and forgot about it. Then, a couple of days later, I got a page again, and once again the same person asked me if I was thinking about her. I said I wasn't, and I was too busy for games, then I hung up. Later that night, when I left work, I noticed a note on my truck that said I made a huge mistake disrespecting her, and I would regret it. I tossed the note and went home. Later that night, at about 2 a.m., my phone rang, and I heard the same voice saying I would get one more chance, then they hung up. The next day, I confronted my friend and said the joke wasn't funny and to quit calling me. He said he didn't know what I was talking about. I told him everything and watched him to see if he grinned or chuckled, but he didn't. A couple more days passed, and I honestly forgot about it. It was my day off, and I needed to run some errands and went to the mall. I was hungry, so I got something to eat at the food court. That's when I noticed a woman sitting and staring at me. I felt uneasy, and I got up and tossed my food wrappers and left. I walked around, looking to see if she was following me, and to my shock, she was. I kept walking aimlessly, and she stayed on my trail. I ducked into a store with two floors, and was able to lose- Bro, like, again, where's the security at? You're in a mall now! Come on, you know how many mall clock shit happens? Come on with it, y'all ass. I was rattled, but didn't have a clue who this woman was. Later that night, I was laying in bed, unable to sleep, thinking about her nonstop. At around 2 a.m., the phone rang, and it scared the crap out of me. I answered it and stated for her to stop bothering me or I would go to the police. Why did it scare The phone clicked and went silent. About an hour later, I heard something outside of my house. I got up and went through the house, looking out all of the doors and windows. When fi go back. I would go to the police. The phone clicked and went silent. About an hour later, I heard something outside of my house. I got up and went through the house, looking out all of the doors and windows, when finally I saw a shadow of a person. Okay, I thought you went outside your house. Standing near my truck. I called 911 and told the operator what was going on, and they sent a deputy sheriff to my house. I stood by the window, hoping they would get there quick before whoever it was left. Thankfully, they did, and the lady was still there. She was taken into custody and the deputy told me that she seemed to be on some type of drug and that she had a note with her about how disrespected I made her feel and she had said all she was going to do was put it on my truck. She also had a fixed blade knife on her but wouldn't say what her intentions were with it. They said they were going to take her to the hospital to get her checked out and suggested that I get a restraining order. I never knew what happened to her and never saw her again, thankfully. I feel like people that's really bad, hold on. I feel like people that's really about it, that really want to clock you up, like, they don't give two shits about a restraining order. If you really about it. If you really want all I was in a hospital in the city, near where I grew up. It's almost finished, yeah? You've been here. I was just kidding. Babe, what you cooking? No, right. No. Top out. Come on. I put I put it in the oven now so it's not cold. What when did it get here? The right time you so God damn. They've been on it. Come on, Papa John's. Domino's. Domino's? I worked second shift, which was 2 30 p.m. until 11 p.m. One night after work, a few of my friends and I went to a popular bar not far from the hospital. We sat around and drank a few beers and had a good time. Soon, it was getting late and I needed to get home. The street the bar was on was a one-way, so I had to go about a block, turn left, go a block over, then another left, which put me on another one-way, but in the direction towards the freeway. When I was driving, I came up to a red light, so I was stopped and waiting. It's important to know that I was driving a full-size GMC pickup with a topper on the bed. The truck was my late father's, which had an important attachment to me. The only thing I didn't like was how it didn't have AC, so I drove with the window partially down, if not completely down. While I was waiting, this dirty looking woman popped up and wanted to know if I wanted to party. To say the woman was disgusting odor-wise would be an understatement. I replied no, to which she then jumped on the sideboard and asked why not, 
then lifted her dirty shirt, exposing herself. I locked the door with my elbow and asked her to get off of my truck and looked up, praying for the- I would have just, I would have just left. I would have just drove the hell off, not giving zero shits about harming her with the car. To change. She kept talking, and I noticed she was trying to see over my truck topper. I glanced over to the passenger side mirror, and I then saw a young man trying to walk quickly, but hunched down. I didn't know what these two had in mind, but I knew it wasn't good. I told the girl to get off of my truck once again, and when she didn't, I gently shoved her shoulder. She then grabbed the side mirror to stay attached to it. I hit the gas as I saw the light change, and the guy stood up and started running. The girl held on for a few seconds to my truck, before finally letting go. I made it to the next light, which was red, but it gave me time to roll up my window, and I looked back at the two, pointing at me, and I guess arguing about the woman not keeping me distracted enough. I made it home without any further issues, but I never ventured into that part of the city again. Hospitals, as far as like workers, but like if you want to work at a hospital, I feel like hospitals. I don't feel. Them. I know hospitals ain't for everybody. They're not for everybody. I know for a fact because you gotta have. You, I feel like you gotta be physically strong, mentally strong, spiritually strong, all that. You know, cause you 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 dealing with the sick. The elderly, the the and you dealing with people dying, and you dealing with dead folks like it's a lot. I feel like that goes. See, it's like you go through all this medical school, right, for like twenty years, and then you get to the hospital, and it's like you gotta deal with like. People's, you gotta deal with people, just in general, people on a daily basis. And people, as a whole, are not the most like I don't know. How to say like, not the most. Mm, it's not easy to get along with people or to like people. Not off rip. But it's like you dealing with all kinds of people in the hospital. And then to add the salt to the wound, you 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 got people with with burns, scrapes, broken limbs, you know, like all kinds of problems. And then you gotta talk to these mother clockers. And then they might be on the verge of dying. And then when they are dead, it's like you gotta deal with the spit. Like, it's just like, it's a lot. And I don't got time for it. Can let somebody, let a patient talk to me crazy. It's rats. Tell my son. Tell my son. I'm, 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 I'm. I'm in a room with the patient. It's just me and the patient. And the patient's talking about something. And I'm like, what you looking at? Oh, I'm not looking at you. I'm looking at Toby. Who's Toby? The person behind you. And I look behind you. Keep it cool. Keep it classy. And I love you. Stay happy. My family. Jesus. <laughs>